Well, welcome back, everybody. It is evening tea time, and I have a returning guest, Allison Hammond here. That's right, and you know how Miss Liz loves having returning guests because the ice is already broken, and we can dig a little deeper. We can get that tea a little stronger. So for everyone who hasn't subscribed to Miss Liz's YouTube channel, run on over, ring that little doorbell, and subscribe. And what does Miss Liz have to offer you? Well, I have over 300 interviews from All Walks of Life in multiple different countries. That's what I got to offer. So ring that little doorbell. It's worth it. Uh, so we're going to get this disclaimer done and we're going to get some bio. But tonight I want you all to have some fun because we're going to do some creative art. We're going to have a little white uh, brush here and we're going to have some markers and we're going to have a whiteboard. Let me bend down. Everybody's going to see Miss Liz tip over and we're going to do some whiteboard. So we want you to interact tonight and we want you to throw some words at us and all of that as well. Allison's going to work with those words that you throw at her and we're going to map. We're going to create some maps. That's right. I told you this afternoon we we're doing maps. So get ready. We're going to have some fun tonight. Um, so let's get started. Let's get the disclaimer. Allison's waiting patiently in the back room and we're going to get her up here. So disclaimer for Miss Liz's Tea Time live show. Miss Liz is going live using StreamYard. Before leaving a comment, please grant StreamYard permission to see your name at StreamYard.com. Please be advised that the content brought forward for any Tea Time show hosted by myself, Miss Liz, is always brought forward in good faith. However, it may bring forth dialogues and opinions that are not representative of my platform. The facts and information are perceived to be accurate at the giving time of airing. All Tea Time guests and audience participants are responsible for using their good judgment in taking any action that may relate to the discussion. The content brought forward may include discussions for some where they may be emotionally at risk. It's significant to know that the show is engaging in discussion forms only to offer and inspire awareness and connection and is not providing therapeutical advice. If you have any questions about the disclaimer or the panelist discussion, you may freely contact me, Miss Liz, through my email at bookingmissliz at gmail.com. Moving forward, should you choose to voluntarily participate in tonight's show in any aspect, I myself, Miss Liz, welcomes you. And should you decide that the show is not made for you at this time, I respect those wishes and we'll see you at a later show at a later date and time. And again, all tea time shows are done at on Thursdays, 3 and 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, unless it's a rescheduled tea time, surprise tea time, or a special tea time. So Miss Liz does them all. So that'll be done on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So now a little bit on Alice and Hammond. I'm going to give you a little bit, and then I'm going to shoot you over to Miss Liz's Facebook page, and you can get her full bio there. So Alice and Hammond is the creator of Responsible, Responsible People and Company to help people and groups design plans for the future based on their gifts, skills, and knowledge through pro processing that use graphic facilitations. This comes from lifelong passion for bringing people together in communities for better lives. From a young age, Allison recognized that all people have unique gifts to share. Having a dancing dancer's heart, Allison loves to be creative and use art to communicate, which fosters her love for love for let me see where to go. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, love for using graphic facilitations that bring people's plans to life. As a natural born teacher and facilitator, she guides people through meaningful and deep conversations to discover their aptitudes, their visions for the future, and how to get there as a communi community. Allison is a trained making action plans, maps, positive alternative tomorrows with hope, path, and charting the life course facilitator, which uses graphic facilitation or stretch notes taking to record the plan. 
These processes focus on individuals or groups that seek to design a future plan in a way that clarifies a version, a vision which acknowledges the gift that people bring to the process. The individual or the group creates a plan based on their aptitudes and what each person can contribute to the outcome. For more on that, all of that, check over on Miss Liz's Facebook page. Let me get Allison in here. And we're going to serve a tea of tolerance, equity, equity, I think I'm saying it right, and ad, ad, audacity, ad, audacity. I'm going to get Allison in here and she can share the tea and we're going to spill it together and have some fun tonight. <laughs> Welcome, Allison. Hi, hi, Miss Liz. It's good to see you. <laughs> I swear, I, that light goes on and it says live and Miss Liz's tongue just, <laughs> it's like somebody steps on it. Like, what are you trying to say, girl? <laughs> so welcome, Allison. It is a pleasure to have you back here. So Allison, just to give a little bit of insight from the view and listeners who may not have seen your first tea time, uh, can you share a little bit on who you were as a little girl and who you are now as a grown woman? Oh, I do say that in my bio, don't I? So as a little girl, I I can remember I usually was the one when I was riding the bus and there would there was one little girl that we would pick up way out in the country and she lived on a farm and now I know she probably didn't have a whole lot. And so often she was wearing the same clothes every day and her hair was messy and the other kids kind of picked on her and I would say, come sit with me. And when, she, when we were in school, the teacher would have me sit next to her and help her. And I've often wondered what happened to that little girl. Or um, that that's just was how my heart was. And I think because we moved a lot while I was growing up, I often found myself recognizing what different people were good at. Um, like that person's musical and that look that person looks interesting because they like to do sports or that girl looks really cool because she knows how to put an outfit together. I don't know. Um, I just was very observant of people. And I think I've carried that through to today that a lot of the work that I've done in my life has been with people that experience disabilities who are often left out, who are often, you know, separated into what we call special programs, which can be very beneficial for them. But we don't always think about making sure they're included in the community, just like we all are. We assume that they need to go to Special Olympics or they have to go live in a group home, but there are other options out there. And as a community, we can support everybody. So I guess that's where the tie-in comes together. So Allison, you work a lot with the disability communities? I do. In fact, that's how I learned to do paths and maps. Those were processes, visual processes that were designed to help people that experience disabilities to plan for their life in the community. And the reason for the visual facilitation with the people that I've met who developed the processes that I use for this specifically um, were because oftentimes a person with a disability, when you're planning for either their educational programming or maybe they're working with their case manager and figuring out things like where they're gonna live and if they're gonna have a job and how and their educational programming, oftentimes those things are all on a, you know, on a piece of paper that looks kind of like this with a lot of check boxes. And people are shuffling these papers around on the table. And if the person with disabilities doesn't really understand what's going on, and or maybe they can't really read, the conversation becomes about them, but, and, but not with them. And if you add the visual piece, doing the paths and the maps, I've got this is, whoops, this is the, the path and the map. Um, then they can see and be much more included in the conversation about their their whole life. The other thing is oftentimes people, and this is true for anybody, Any, and that's one reason whenever I do these programs or paths or processes, somebody else in the room will say, I need someone to do that for me. And it's often a family member or somebody who's also in a life transition. And when you bring people together to help do the plan, everybody has insights. They know the person. They can give suggestions. They know people in different ways. And so it really becomes a conversation with the person, 
so that they have the agency to have more decision in what their their plan's going to look like. So that's where the visual piece actually came from. And not to jump too far ahead, but that is where when I started doing the drawing along with facilitation and planning, and I went, oh my gosh, I wish I would have known about this. I love doing this. It is my calling. And I kind of fell into it somewhat accidentally. Um, but that's how I got started. And so I do still work with people that experience disabilities as well as since 2019, I've worked with a lot of different kinds of people using, using um, visual facilitation. So do you use it on the, uh, on any schools or, or universities or anything like that as well? Um, so I've done, a um, I actually was when I was listening to my last interview, I was in the middle of working on a contract with a group of schools in southwest Michigan who had a grant to um, it was all about getting early literacy materials into the hands of families that are the most difficult to reach. And so I worked with those school administrators in preschool and we actually designed a plan for their program and um, so I helped them design the plan. I facilitated some other meetings. I was, the thing is, it's so funny in the work that I do. So the woman that I worked with during that, um, shortly after that, she was my connection. She retired. So I know that they developed this whole social media um, program that was really targeting the, because we know a lot of the families in that commu those communities even though English is their second language, many of them are on social media, especially following um, social media that pertains to them in their own language, because that's where they find resources. So um, I know that they actually did that. I don't know what the results are. <laughs> so Allison, I want to, what are we getting into first, the paths or the maps? What comes first? So that's a great question. The um, main tools that I use for planning are actually, there's three of them. So the first one is this next step navigator. And that is a very quick, you got to make a decision. You've got something that needs um, so an answer that you need. You need to make a decision. Um, you're stuck on something. This is like a one hour process that you can get your next first step that you're going to do in the next 24 to 48 hours. So sometimes that's where I start with people. And then a path, uh, the camera's backwards for me. <laughs> the path, a path is really for planning for one year. Like, what do you want your life to look like in one year? And then a map is actually longer terms, more like three years. And so often when I work with um, groups, like I've worked with several nonprofits, now, I've actually done paths for them because in this changing world, in the nonprofit world, sometimes they may have like a three to five year strategic plan already in place, but they get stuck on, well, so what are we actually going to do in this first year? And so if I do a path for them that they can have hanging on the wall in their boardroom that they can see, oh, this is where we want to go. This is where we are now. These are the resources we have. Oh, these are the steps we said we're going to take. Who's going to do what and by when? Then it's not in a notebook on a shelf someplace that people have to pull out and open to, to look at. Um, it's right there in a picture that they helped create. So that I would, just, I would say is the tool that I use the very most with groups. Um, yeah, so, so that's kind of the order. And in the meantime... I, well, I didn't draw on here. There's an, another tool that's called Charting the Life Course, and that comes out of the University of Missouri. And Charting the Life Course, what I like about that is you're talking about the future, but when you talk about where you are now, you talk about what's working, what's not working. You talk about in the future what you want to see happening, what you don't want to see happening. And then in, when you actually do the steps, you talk about what are the next steps you're going to do, and then what are some things you're going to either stop doing or you're not going to do right now. And that is really helpful for a lot of things, but especially groups, because sometimes with a nonprofit, they only have so many resources. And it's very easy to want to be all things to all people. 
So if you say, well, for now, to work towards this future, we're just going to take these steps. These are on the back burner, or these are things that we've been doing, but we just don't have the resources for anymore. So we're going to stop doing it. And it really makes that very clear um, in the planning. And once again, it ends up in a picture all together that is that they can hang up someplace and, and refer to. So Allison, with the path, I noticed that there's, it's like an arrow. And yes. you know, in the error, what are the three words? What What is the, the flow oh, of that? Sure. So this, what you have the person do is I, I don't, I tend not to use words like vision, goal, dream. Um, I've been in way too many planning processes where people spend 30 minutes debating what those words mean. So okay. I simply say, what do you want things to look like? What are you doing? Who's there? Um, what's happening? Where are you? <laughs> what's the timing? And if people want to say, oh, that's our goals, then that's fine. But I ask them, what does it look like? And then we talk about where are you now? And then we talk about what are the gifts? And when I say gifts, that could be the people that have the gifts. That could be resources you have. It could be the location that has certain attributes that are working. It's it's what do you have that's, that's working for you that you can use? And then in this arrow, you actually say, okay, what are things going to look like in six months that are leading toward this one-year plan? So some people might call that benchmarks. Um, and then... But the steps that you take are really in a path. It's what are you going to do in the next week to a month that's going to lead towards the sixth month that's going to lead to the future. And when I've worked with groups, sometimes they'll take those steps and then they'll say, well, let's meet again. So I don't need to completely do the whole path. We might say, OK, you did those steps. You worked towards those benchmarks. Given all this, what are the next steps you're going to take? So you can literally to put another piece of paper right there and say, okay, these are the next steps. And uh, yeah, that really helps people um, get moving and actually into action. Instead of, like I said, it's it's in a pretty notebook up on a shelf someplace. <laughs> so when you're putting all these words in, Allison, are, are you getting like the group to give you a word for each area, like each department? Like, well, it's, you're doing a group facilitation, right? It's a, it's kind of a group, everybody's ideas all together and kind of coming to consensus. One thing that I do tell people is that I'm not going to put something up there if they don't really think that's the right thing. So on occasion, I may have another piece of paper, like a parking lot sitting next to it, where we put all the ideas down and then we may say, okay, what do we really want to put in the path? So I do that sometimes. Um, the oh, other oh thing, God. yeah, the other thing that I, sometimes I don't have to say this, but in some groups, I need to tell people to stop shooting on each other. Like you should do this, we should do that, should, 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 should. And that really doesn't um, get people to agreement or really buying in to what they're going to do. It's more from a place of what they think they think they should do, but are they really going to do it? <laughs> yeah. When I hear the word should, it's, it's almost like projecting, right? You're projecting what you want me to do without even understanding what I need to do. Right. And I think we look so much outside of ourselves for uh, recognition and, you know, and um, the okay to do it, right? Mm -hmm. You're allowed to do this. You're allowed just try it just go and do it you know like instead of the should should when i hear the word should i think my shoulders right somebody oh, pushed i me. don't do well with should. maybe that's why i'm conscious of it if you don't mind really quick i'll share a quick example of a path that i did with a church group a church communication committee okay and they had a laundry list of things that they were supposed to be doing as the communication committee for the church and they came in the room with this laundry list. And I think what they thought was going to happen was we would just prioritize that list. Well, we went through, well, what do you want things to look like? What does What is the communication doing a year from now? What results do you want to see from better communication in the church? And then we talked about all the things that were happening right now, their whole list of things they were trying to do. 
and then what resources they have. And it was interesting, though, um, what the next first step that they came up with is let's make sure all of the church committees are at least getting us the information for the website calendar. That was their only thing that they were going to work on, was making sure that was happening. And just that by doing, concentrating and focusing on that one thing, all of the other stuff fought, started falling into place because that gave them what they needed to put in the church newsletter. That gave them what they might put on the church outdoor sign. <laughs> that gave them um, what would go on the Facebook page. It really fed all that just by making sure that what was what was happening in the church was getting on the church calendar. It simplified everything, but they wouldn't have come up with that if together they hadn't been sharing where they are, if I hadn't been facilitating, and then they could actually see it unfolding. Um, so I, that's one of my favorites, favorite stories because they were like, well, that's all we have to do. But it's not, it, it, that's, it, it sounds like a, it, like it's, I did a magic wand, but I didn't. They had to do a lot of work and thinking as I was facilitating to get to that point. <laughs> well, a lot of times we over, overdo stuff, right? Like we're, we're doing this, doing this, doing this, and then nothing gets done because right. we're, we're, everybody's in different pots. Right. Right. And, and we have to come together and have that communication and be able to say, you know what, let's baby steps. And I love that it's an arrow because it's taking you through the steps, right? Yep. It's like a bow and arrow. If you pull mm -hmm. it back, you know, it moves forward. Yeah. So this one, I like the, so this one, you do the steps in like a spiral. So it becomes like a target. You end up drawing like a target if that's the name step. The um, map also is air, arrows that kind of go up toward the, toward the future. So there's, there's design in the, um, in the drawing. Well, it kind of goes all together, right? So the navigator, then the path, and then the map, mm -hmm. it's almost like a trip, right? Yes. You, you want to plan where you're going the trip Then the path you have to figure out, are you renting a car? Are you taking a plane? Get all of that. And then the map, the location of where you're going to be celebrating, like, you know, it's kind of like a flow. And that's mm -hmm. what I see like a nice flow. And even as you're sitting there, Alice, and I can see like the little the lady over here with the pen and then the circle and then the arrow and then boom, it's, it looks like a castle, like a little house here. <laughs> I wanted to say chapeau. I don't know why I say chapeau, but chapeau is a French word. I don't know why I'm talking about a hat because it's a hat. <laughs> but it looks the like, you know, like, French I knew, I knew that was a, I knew that was a hat. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but it, it feels like a flow, right? And as even as you're sitting there, the image behind you is like a flow. And that's just like your tea. Like your tea is like a flow, uh, like it was the last time. And tonight we're going to share that tea as well. So let's get into that tea. And let's give me a little bit on why you gave me those words and what comes to mind when you give me those words. So tolerance for your tea. So... <clears throat> tolerance, I think it's because right now I have been doing some work in a few organizations related to racial equity here in the United States. And so that word comes up a lot. But then also in my, um, you know, working with people with disabilities. And I think sometimes I think tolerance isn't exactly the right word, but it starts with T. It really is that there are different people in our communities and we don't have to like everybody, but we do need to get along. And sometimes we need to take a step back and realize that's how those, that's how a certain group of people, that's how their life is. And then there's other people that their life's this way. And there are ways to come together as a community once, if you can at least tolerate each other, you could get into a room and, and actually have a conversation. Or we don't have to start worrying about, well, I don't like what those people are doing over there, even though it may have no impact at all on what I'm doing. So that's really for the T. Equity has to do with, again, um, when... So my work with people with disabilities is really where this starts for me and then and then the racial equity. But 
we don't realize that people that experience disabilities, particularly intellectual disabilities, are often the most segregated people in at least the United States. We think that we're doing them a favor by ha only having them live in places where there's people that are specially trained to help them or send them to schools where there's only people that are specially trained or we go to the Special Olympics, which is just for special people. And I don't, there's a, so I think of that as a continuum. So there may be some people experiencing disabilities. Maybe that's where they need to start or maybe that's where they want to start or maybe that's where they want to participate. And that's perfectly fine. That is a choice. But there's an assumption um, and here in Kalamazoo, I, the organization I worked for before, we would go into like the Boy Scouts or um, the YMCA was starting an art, an art program that had the performing arts in it. And it's, they would say, instead of creating the program for the kids with disabilities, we want to make sure we're able to include them in the program we already are doing. And so that was my job is I would go in and help them figure out how they were going to do that. And um, they, I've got, I could go on and on and on about beautiful stories related to that. Or right now I'm working with some families that have child, adult children who have been living at home with them. The parents are of a certain age, my age and older, <laughs> and they're now realizing, oh, my child, my loved one, my adult here that's 30 or 40 years old has always lived with me. Where are they going to go when, if they can't live with me anymore? And our communities really aren't set up for that. There are some residential areas where we have some apartments that are set up where people can live in pretty independently. And then there's some staff on site. Those are far and few between. Um, there's also opportunities for people to, um, you know, to live just with one roommate in a, an apartment someplace. But there really aren't a lot of opportunities because as a community, what we will fund is creating a group home where we put the park those people over there in a group. And some group homes are wonderful. Others are really not so great as far as people getting to live the life that they want to leave. So um, so that's kind of some of the things that I get into related to equity. And then what was the last? Oh, audacity. So my word, I had two words for this year. It was. Um, audacity, meaning that I was going to be audacious. And so what I started doing is I draw everywhere I go because I was, as much as I like to draw, I always thought people are going to think that's weird if I'm meeting with them and I bring a piece of paper and I start drawing pictures for the notes. Well, that was silly. So I've audacious, audaciously been drawing. And I've also become a little bit more audacious in declaring that most of us are visual learners. Written language was based on characters and drawings. We did that first. So it, that's one reason when I'm drawing along with words, it becomes more inclusive because more people can share in the meaning. And um, so I become more audacious and just stepping into the power of what I do. I love it. Stepping into the power. You know, since the last time you've been on Tea Time, I can see the transformation as well, Allison. Oh, um, thank you. <laughs> because I remember the the background of the first time when you were on Tea Time and you had the, all the different colors. This time I'm noticing that you got the blues. You got a little bit of pink. I see a heart here, you know. Uh, but I mean, the, the transformation of when you were last on Tea Time is huge, uh, you know. And you're... And, I really want to thank you for all your support during the since you've been on tea time too as well. Um, but could you teach us a little bit tonight about the path and the math for anybody that would like to sure. reach out to you and you know yeah. maybe get you as a facilitator in their their organization or their business yeah. or you know it's funny you asked me that because just yes just last night actually or Tuesday night um, I have a colleague who is a coach for people that are getting ready to retire. And he and I have developed a workshop where we have people create a path. So I'm going to give you a mini, just a mini. So I would just invite people, if they've got a whiteboard, or even if you've got a piece of paper like this, just to simply draw, you know, an arrow. And, and you, if you don't want to get really fancy like that, you can just go like, you know, make a rectangle. 
with an arrow here <laughs> and then divide it like this and then give yourself a circle for your I don't care that I'm messing this up. I use, I go through so much paper. Um, <laughs> so I just want to invite you to, to write down, you know, one to three things really quick that you would like to see yourself doing in a year. And for this example, even if it's just one thing, because we don't have a lot of time to think a lot about it, but just put a one to three things in this circle. And I like, so if you want to draw people, let me show you this. People are really easy. You just make a circle with two lines and then you can make their arms doing all kinds of things and you can, you know, make the person standing. There's lots of things you can do with that to make people. Um, or, you know, if, you, if you're thinking about, you know, in a year you want to be in a different house, that's very easy to do. Um, maybe you want to start playing tennis. So you draw a tennis ball and a tennis racket. You know, you don't have to get, it's, we're not hanging this in the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. <laughs> That's a good thing because this is can't draw. <laughs> All right. So I was talking during that. So so here's, here's where you're going to put your future in a year. Okay. So then I want you related to where you want to be in a year. Think about where are you right now? So when we did this, um, there was a woman in the workshop. She's going to retire in a year and she has no idea. One of the things she wants to do is she wants to have one place that she's volunteering regularly. So that was one of the things she wanted to know in a year. So where she is right now is she has no idea. She hasn't explored anything. She has no idea. So that's where she is now. Then in the gifts, what you want to do is write down relate, you know, related to that, what do you already have? And so this woman wrote down things like she already has some connections to her church. She already has some connections through her job. She works for the family health clinic here in town where she could look at what volunteer opportunities there are there. Um, she knows as far as gifts, she knows she's really good at organizing things. Um, she's really good at strategic planning. So she put some of those things in her gifts that can help her figure out what she wants to do. Then in this triangle here, this is the benchmark. So she said in six months, she will have tried two things. That's her I benchmark. Like, I like the, that word benchmark, right? It's like sit down and, and, and think about it. Yeah. <laughs> I should have done this. So here's one. This is two. Your now. Yep. And then your gifts is three. Benchmarks, you're going to jump over here. And then this is your steps. So based on your benchmarks and all of this, what is for this purpose tonight? What's one thing that you could do in the next week or a month? that's gonna lead you to this benchmark. And so what this woman said, by the end of July, she will have contacted two places where she can go do a trial volunteer opportunity. So that's her step. Seems really simple, but when she came in to the workshop, she was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm retiring in a year. I don't know what I'm going to do with myself. I think I want to volunteer, but I'm not really sure. Blah, blah, blah. She's just looking in here. And now she's got a plan for at least one thing <laughs> that she will have done to work towards having one. And of course, when I when I do this with, with a person or a group, there's a lot more things people might want to have in the future than one thing. But that just gives you an idea. So I hope I went through that really fast. But I hope for some people out there that was helpful to just stop and think, oh, if I did that one thing, then that would get me closer to actually having done that in a year. <laughs> right. It's that one step. You know, if we don't put the steps out there, how do we move forward? Uh, oh, I said I should say the other thing that we had the people in the workshop do is identify with that step who in your because. We were facilitating, we can be your accountability person, but who in your life are you going to say, you know what, I'm going to call two places and I'm going to do that by the end of the month and I'm going to tell you that. So this woman said, you know, my brother lives in nearby and we talk, I 
talk to him on and on and on about my retirement. So I'm going to tell him I'm going to try two places by the end of August. So that, that was the accountability piece. So we didn't, like just leave her, we didn't just leave her out there hanging and go, yeah, I hope you do that. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think that's what we need is more accountability. Right. And I think a lot of people don't even understand what accountability is right? because they've never been taught it. Right. Especially if somebody like like you mentioned, like somebody who lives at home for 40 years, they've never had the accountability of living on their own, the independence of being, mm -hmm. you know, taking that step, making that meal right. and that, you know, um, that this is it does kind of go along with this. But there was um, as an example with this group of parents, there were two families that came and their sons who are on the autism spect spectrum both of them need 24 seven supports because they um, they're brilliant, but they also don't make necessarily the best decisions. They can get sidetracked and often like you don't want them cooking with nobody around. But what they said was they were nervous, so nervous to have these two young men go live together because they thought it was going to just be a disaster. You know what? Those two young men within a month, they stepped up to the plate. They take care of their rooms, not perfectly, but they do pick up their own rooms. They do help and make sure that their own laundry is sorted. They do do these things that, frankly, mom had already always done for them. And, of course, they acted like they couldn't do it. <laughs> but lo and behold, they could. I told these parents, I said, I also have a son that's, you know, he, when he went off to college, I thought, oh, boy. But as soon as he lived in a apartment with other young men, he suddenly realized the value of cleaning the bathrooms. <laughs> right. It, I didn't it, have to tell him. <laughs> well, I, I, we have a question here for you, Allison. So what's oh, sure. the difference between path maps and vision boards? That's a great question. And you know, that got asked in, or you asked me that actually in the last one. I think so. Um, so to me, a a vision board is part of this. So when you're creating your, your future here, you really are somewhat doing a vision board. This takes it the next step further to what are you actually going to get into action and do. So when I was on Miss Liz before I, I did said this example, I did a vision board with um, through another workshop I went to. And I came home with my vision board and I showed my husband and my son and they said, that's nice. And then it sat in my room. And so my example is if I take my vision board and then I actually develop a path of how I'm going to get there and I include my husband, um, I've actually, I, for my business, I have a plan. So I, I did, I include my husband and my son, my business coach, um, some other colleagues of mine. And so now my husband and my son know what I'm working toward and they can be much more supportive of me than just saying, isn't it nice that mom's out there trying to do this? You know, my son's done a lot. My son's a graphic designer, so he's done some work for me. My husband helps me with my business stuff. He doesn't just, just look at me as, isn't it that nice what she's doing with her little business over there? He knows how to help me and where I need help. So it goes beyond the vision board. I, th I think that's deeply important, right? Having that support system. You know, where it's not just a tap on the head. Oh, that's so nice that you're doing that, that's you know, so <laughs> <laughs> right? So well, I I, I, don't so want to I just want to make sure that I'm oh, doing this oh. right. So I shared a little bit here. So, so I the love stats it. On the one day. So it's that simple, right? Just get a white well, yes. some markers and, you know, take the steps. And what I want to do in the next year is be on the stage. I want to have a Miss Liz uh, stage where people can come and share their stories and we can do these kind of workshops and that in person, you know, virtual mm -hmm. land is nice, but in person is also nice because mm -hmm. you can communicate and have that one-on-one. -on -one. And a lot of people do better when they see, like you said, visual, right? Mm -hmm. So people see yeah. visual virtually, but in person, it's a different step as well. So, mm -hmm. uh, Allison, I want to get you to talk a little bit about the maps now. So the maps is kind of like the long-term goals, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a longer-term goal. And so one of my target audiences right now is working with people that are thinking about retiring in the next few years. And 
a lot of people will be working with their financial advisor. If they have some health things going on, they might be also working with, you know, a health kind of plan with either their health care provider or something like that. But even my own financial planner said, people, they've got their money, they've got those things in a row, they kind of know where they're going to live. But basically what they plan for when they retire is their big bucket list. So that means where they're going to travel. Are they going to buy a second home in the South someplace? Um, are they going to golf every day? Are they going to, you know, travel? And that those are all great things to plan for. But what a lot of people don't plan for is what they're going to do in their daily life. So like my friend said, you know, she recognized she needs something to do. You know, she's really looking forward to taking long walks, working in her garden, spending more time with her family. But she wants to make sure she's doing something that's still contributing to the community. And so that's where where a map can really be helpful because you can ask people. So in three years when you're retired, do you want to live near your your children? Um how do you want to stay connected to your friends that maybe aren't retired or people that are moving away? Um, how are you going to um, maybe stay connected to your coworkers? Where do you want to contribute in the community on a regular basis? Maybe you want to go back to school. You know, what are some other things that you want to be doing in three years? Because sometimes you need to put some steps in place. Now, I'm going to make a confession right now. I have a friend who lives in town that does this visual work. And I still have to get him to come over and do this with my husband and I, because my husband's going to retire in two years. And we talk. I'm a perfect example. We talk about where we want to travel. We might want to do this. We've got our financial. We have worked with our financial planner. We know that that's all in place. But, you know, I still keep spending money on this and that and the other thing. I really want to travel. So maybe we ought to say, you know, in three years from now, we're going to do a European cruise, a riverboat cruise. And right now I need to start thinking about what that looks like. So because, yes, we'll have our we, we will have our finances that can help pay for our lifestyle. But for those special things, we probably need to start thinking about that now instead of just chirp, chirp, chirping. So um, that would be more like what you would do with a map. And I can't. Um, I can't share screen. I actually also did a map for my mom and dad a few years ago because they're, um, they knew their health was starting to decline. They had chosen that they were not going to, they wanted to stay in their own home as long as they possibly could. And so when we did that, um, actually that was close to two years ago. It's now coming to fruition. My dad has, um, He's, he's struggling with how his mind is working and my mom struggles with mobility and they laugh because together they make us a whole person. <laughs> but, you know, it's been interesting because my sister and I have found that there's some things that we need to let them just be and let them make their own decisions and continue to be as independent as they want to be. And, you know, keeping an eye out for safety. My mom did have a fall this last um, March, which... Um, then we need, there were some decisions and thought that needed to go on. So it's been really handy that we actually had talked through that because it's hard for my sister and I sometimes, but they are very happy where they are and they really are living out what they wanted in their map. And so we're doing, we're doing our best not to stick our nose in <laughs> and tell them what to do, but uh, we still do share our concerns, honestly, but you know, it, it, that's that's working out for them. And um, yeah, so so that's really more of what a map would be. I'll tell so you a map is kind of like a house, right? Because that's what you, I'm seeing yeah. here. It's kind of like a house. Uh, right? and it's it's more like your future is is up here instead of just going here. I think it's more of a design thing. These are should be arrows going up. Your future's here. And, um, you know, you you figure out like where in the community are you going to do things and then your steps. This isn't the best example of a of a map. You know where else a map comes in handy is if you have kids that are in high school and they don't know what they want to do with their life. Oh. What it what it can do is have them have some ideas and then what they might want to try and do while they're in college because you know we know today 
most people, I, I don't know the statistics on this, but a lot of people go to college to study one thing. They come out of college, they might do that for a while, but then they'll do something else and they'll do something else. And, and uh, I find um, some of the younger people I know are so overwhelmed by the vast array of choices that they have today. Yeah. Um, with the internet and everything, you can, you know, if you study, like my son, he studied graphic design. He could have done a lot of different things. He fortunately, you know, found a job almost right after he graduated from college. But, um, you know, that doesn't happen for everybody. And so sometimes people end up, and they do have a lot of choices. <laughs> So this can also be helpful for somebody in that age range as well. Well, I think it's pretty cool. Like I, I'm over here doodling while you're talking and I'm, you know, bucket list and everything. What, where, when, like, you know, my board is getting full over here. Um, you know, and sometimes we just got to doodle and we got to put it down. Right. And sometimes mm -hmm. when we draw little images and that it really opens the mind as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you showed a couple images here, like, um, for people and uh, what else did you draw back there, Allison? Oh, so I was just kind of giving examples of <laughs> when you draw, you can really, you don't have to make things complicated. Like, you know, that's a, you can draw a person as really a person with a half circle and you can make their arms just lines going whichever way. I'll, I'll show you how to draw a cat. You just make a couple, right, a couple triangles with a circle, a couple lines down like this. There's their paws. That's cat. <laughs> oh, wow. Dogs are a little more complicated because dogs have either pointy or dangly ears. So you can draw an oval. And if they have pointy ears, you do that. But then they have the same shape, basically, as a cat. They've got dangly ears. You can do it this way. So your cat's we, <laughs> we have a question here for you, Allison. Sure. Do image open the mind? Does imagery open the mind? I'm guessing drawing images. Yes. Open. That's an awesome question. Yes, it does. When we, so it depends on the research you read. About 60 to 70% of people think visually. They think in pictures they remember things in pictures. They see the future in pictures. When I'm talking about pictures, I'm not talking like pictures um, like we're drawing here, but you know, visualizing it, whether you see it in color or black and white. And if you can capture those pictures, even if it's just doodles like this, it actually helps you remember and think through that better than if you just use words or just spoken language. And I... Um, so I, I know that and I've seen it. In fact, when um, another thing about, you know, equity is when I do this kind of planning with groups, there's often the person that's more vocal and then the person that needs to think a little bit longer before they can figure out what they're going to say. And if you've drawn pictures of what the person who talks a lot, what their ideas are, and then the person and then they tend to not talk as much. Because now what they've said is there, everybody can see it. <laughs> and then the people that need more time to think is because I'm drawing, it takes longer than just writing words, you know, listing words on a, on a post-it paper. They have more time to think. And because there's images, they're like, oh, this is where I, what I'm thinking fits in with that. So it really, there is... Um, there is research to show that I don't know all the statistics and things, but it's been also my experience that it helps. And I, I did a plan for um, a group at my church and we, we had two hours to create this plan because we just scheduled two hours. Well, we were done in an hour and a half. And that's because the people that have to re keep repeating themselves didn't do that. People got to share their ideas. People could stay focused because I'm drawing, which is very interesting to watch. <laughs> and everybody in the room was like, wow, we did a lot in an hour and a half. So it, I, it's, it's true. That was, a, that was an excellent question. Thank you for asking that. Well, and, and I know arts is used a lot to uh, expression, right? 
how to express yourself. So mm -hmm. sometimes if you can't think of the word, you can think of an image and you can put mm -hmm. that picture down and you can say, this is what I'm trying to say, but I can't say it. I can't, mm -hmm. you know, like sometimes when you, it's on the tip of your tongue, but you can't say it, but you can draw it, right? It's like that right. game, win, lose, and draw, you know, yes. where <laughs> you get a word and you have to draw it. And it doesn't matter if it's the best out there, but people get, get the understanding of what you're drawing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And sometimes people, um, if they're taking notes, if they may not be dr drawing pictures for what they're hearing, they may still be, be taking notes. But if you ever notice, there's some people that they like, they'll, they're doodling patterns, like circles or thing, and they're coloring little things. And while they're listening, because that does actually help people stay focused. You know, some teachers would say, you're over there doodling. You couldn't possibly be paying attention. But actually for that person, focusing on that pattern that they're drawing is helping them focus more on what the teacher is saying. And then oftentimes whatever the teacher says that, that they can find is important, they hear it better. So then they'll, they'll put that in their note because they're already they're focused on the doodle that they're doing, which may not may look like it doesn't have anything to do with what the teachers talk. I tend to draw flowers. <laughs> <laughs> I do little squares and then the little squares turn into a, a, something else. And then I'm just like, how the heck? I like to do dot to dots, right? Yeah. I just like to put dots on, on a board. And then I just like to squiggle it this way, go mm -hmm. this way. And then I end up with an image, right? And I'm just like, how did that happen? You know, and I love dot to dots. And we talked about this the last time when you were on, yeah. um, you know, just getting yeah. the pen in your hand. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, um, I think I said to you this before that one of my one of my big picture ideas is that is to have more people feel released to draw like and I love it that you had people get their whiteboards out and I love it that you drew and you tried it and whatever, because I think we think of, um, you know, art, like you have to, in order for you to be drawing, you need to be good enough to have something in a museum or be a graphic designer or, and then, you know, I'm a dancer too. And I always tell people dancing is just fancy walking. People think, so now people think of dance like, oh, I can't be a dancer unless I'm good enough to be on. So you think you can dance. That's not yeah. true. We as human beings like to move to the rhythm of music. So um, it's the same thing with drawing. And I tell the story that I had a thing about drawing, didn't think I could draw because my kindergarten teacher told me I didn't finger paint right. <laughs> and look where you are today, Allison. <laughs> You know, there's some teachers out there that, you know, but they, that motivated you because look at you didn't give up. No, you still, you still I drew it. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what we need to do, right? Even if someone gives us an opinion or tells us that, we just got to keep moving forward. And I bet people out there watching all have a story about being told something related to the arts. Like, oh, you really don't sing well or you don't dance well or you don't draw well. And then we give up the arts because... We're not going to do it to, you know, to the level where maybe we're going to do a public performance, but we certainly can enjoy dancing socially or, or dancing when no one else is watching. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, and I love that you didn't give up, you know, because that's what I like. I like when, uh, you know, somebody says, oh, you can't do that. You're not doing it right. And you just continue. You just do it because it's in you, mm -hmm. you know, um, mm -hmm. and again, you said like, you don't need to be a professional at at it, you know, just enjoy yourself. Take the pen, draw. I did some doodling tonight, and I'm not the best doodler. No, uh, and I love it. You got something <laughs> out of it. <laughs> well, we're almost at the end here, Allison. I want to get into. Uh, Allison has also written a book, and I, I, I got the book last uh, the last time she was on. So let's talk a little bit about this book. We have a few minutes, uh, and I'd like to really get this book out because this book is really important for parents out there as well. Uh, and children. Uh, there's a lot. It's an easy read and it's called Becoming a Parent Through Powerful Promises. So do you want to tell us a little bit about that book briefly? Sure. Um, in, a pre in a previous role that I had, I was 
called a school readiness readiness coordinator and I would take materials out to this rural school district here in Michigan to families that had children zero to five years old and it was developmental information as long as well as like a children's book and some other thing activity things well one thing I noticed was the the reading level of a lot of the materials was like at the 12th grade level and we know in the United States I believe the average reading age is like fifth to sixth grade and then a lot of the parents that we were working with, I didn't even know if perhaps they could read. So I decided there needed to be a picture book for parents. So I wrote this this picture book. I did not do the drawings in this. A friend of mine did. She's She really is a very good artist drawing. She drew the picture. She's very good at that. And there's 11 promises, I believe. And... Um, it's so when you read it, there's the promise, which is a simple sentence, and then there's a brief description underneath it, and then underneath that, there's a little bit more in depth information about what that promise means. But really, you can get a lot out of just reading what the promises are. Like, one of the promises is, I promise to feed you healthy food, I promise to take you to, um, I promise to get you involved in the community. I promise to buckle you in your seatbelt. I promise to, you know, keep you, take you to play on the playground. I can't remember all of them. You'd think I, I don't have them memorized, but um, yeah. And well, so this is my favorite one, Allison, in the book. It's called, I promise to hold and hug you every day. Yes. And, uh, and then, so not only, so it says that, but then there, there's also some information below about why that's important to have that physical contact with your children and how that helps them developmentally. So anyway, so that, so I did that book um, with my friend, my husband edited, edited it because once again, he kept saying, you're still writing this, it's too complicated. <laughs> um, he was my editor. And then we published that self-published through um, lulu.com and I've been working to get it on Amazon. It's more, you wouldn't, if you've done, those of you who out there, I know Miss Liz has a lot of people that have done books. Um, I did it on Lulu. Transitioning to um, Amazon publishing is more complicated than you might imagine. So that's why it's not there yet, but I did that. And then, um, yeah, so I did that. But if you don't mind, I also, I have a TikTok that I started doing a while ago. So I do these little drawings on TikTok and they're animated. Oh. And so I took the drawings and I put them in these picture books and they're all, they're inspirational quotes, whatever. And so the reason there's these post-its is I'm putting these into categories and then I'm going to, um, I am gonna publish these through Amazon. And what I like, what I was told and, and I didn't even think to do this. Somebody else suggested it. You know, what I was told is once again, I've got these inspirational things, but it's my drawings and they're just, you know, they're just simple. I, I, it's simple. It, it brings a stronger, impactful message because it, it's the ones out there that says, well, I can't do it because I'm not good at that. I'm not. And then they pick up your book and they look at it and they say, oh, I can do it too. Yeah. And, yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I really, I really love the book that you sent me, and I can't wait for that book to come out. So when that one comes out, please let me know. Uh, it is a lot of work with Amazon. I, I published my books last year, and it is a lot of work. So there's a lot of work that goes behind making a book, and writing a book, and getting mm -hmm. it published, and all of that. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even it's, you know, it's good. I, I, I think it's. I have also have another book that was published by Human Kinetics, and I can't even remember what year. It's about adapted physical education, and um, the the thing is that when you self publish, you do have some more control over a lot of things, which is really nice. And um, but publishing for a publishing house, then of course they advertise it and it's in their materials, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, there's the advantages and disadvantages to doing it both ways. Yeah. So Allison, what kind of message do you have for everybody tonight? My message is draw. <laughs> um, just pick up a, you know, a piece of paper and, uh, you know, draw and it, you don't even have to, make it a daily practice or anything like that, but just, just challenge yourself and, and feel okay with it. And if you, if drawing isn't really your thing, maybe it's writing. 
um, just feel more comfortable with doing that. Or maybe it is dancing, but just thinking about how you can express yourself and communicate through through arts and creativity and not just the technical written language and spoken word, which those obviously are very important, but you may find that it opens your ability to communicate with people in a different and more creative way and get your ideas across, as well as encouraging people to have other ways in order to communicate with you. So you remember the, the cavemen drew on cave walls. So visual facilitation is actually an ancient thing. I didn't create this. <laughs> <laughs> it's been around for a long time. It has been. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a comment from a past Tea Time guest as well. And he says, hey, Miss Liz, your guests can create a KDP account. And on that account, they can be guided as to the production of the, her book for Amazon. So that, that comes from Michael. Uh, there are some different formatting specifications for Amazon that probably is why she's getting issues getting the book published on Amazon from Lulu. Yeah. So uh, I can, I can connect you with, uh, with Michael and, and all of that. And I, I really want to thank the people that are li listening and yes, watching on Amazon. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, Amazon on Instagram. We're talking about Amazon. Now we're doing Instagram. Uh, we have a bunch of listeners over there and uh, we had some listeners from uh, other platforms. I really want to thank you guys for tuning in and listening tonight. And if you took your whiteboard out and you had your markers out, uh, thank you for doing that. Uh, you know, and if, it and put it on the Facebook. <laughs> share it with us because we'd love to see your your boards and, and, and that. Miss Liz always likes to throw in a little different twist and turns from time to time with all of the tea time guests. Uh, and I thought it would, be, it would be fun tonight to get your markers out and your whiteboards out and all of that good stuff. So we will be back on two, uh, Monday, uh, the 22nd, with uh, a rescheduled tea time. Janice Burnett, she will be in the house with Miss Liz. And we'll be talking about her, her work and her book. And then we'll also be back on Thursday with two other guests. And we're closing up July and then the press release for August guests will be out soon. So you'll get to see all of those good juicy guests that are coming and we're serving more tea. Uh, and we have a couple surprises coming up in, in the fall. So stay tuned for that. Uh, again, Allison, I want to thank you so much. Uh, before we wrap up, Allison, if anybody would like to reach you, could you just spell out your website for the audio listeners? Sure. It's responseable, R-E-S-P-O-N-S-A-A-B-L-E, -E, responseable people p e o p l e dot com thank you so much and thank you all for tuning in and i will be back with more tea next week same time same place and we'll do this all over again until then stay tuned and miss liz will keep you serving real life teas through words and storytelling thanks liz